Hello, everybody, and welcome to the October 26th Classroom 2.0 Live show. Um, I'm Lori Moffat, one of the co-hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thank you, Tammy, for always doing the closed captioning for us. Um, if you are going to be speaking during the show towards the end, uh, please make sure that you've checked out the audio setup wizard and that's located at this blue microphone with the red starburst like icon next to it that'll test your audio for the for the session quickly for uh, convenience for blackboard the chat can be moved over so you can drag the title of the chat pod to the other side of the screen and I always do that for shows and I also increase the text size of, of the chat because chat does go by pretty quickly so again welcome to our show today our topic is uh, Linda Rood, who's our featured teacher for today here's our live binder page for this week's show the links here at the bottom but Peggy will put it into to to chat and note that we've got the um, links for the various pages on the left column rather than across the top with a lot of live binders all the recordings are posted at the archive and resources page at the live classroom 2.0 website we'd like to find out where in the world you're logging in from you all have the whiteboard tools click on the second tool down and that's a, a pointer icon I'm in the middle of Pennsylvania so go ahead and show us where in the world you are we do have people from all over the world join us for these shows. And here's our first poll question for Linda. Do you have a BYOD program in your school? And choose, of course, the green check, yes for yes, and, and the red X for no. Please don't try to vote on the screen. That vote isn't going to work you vote with the icons above everybody's name underneath your name in the top part of the participants pod and if you don't have a school you've got to say no to this of course all right I'm going to go and and post the whiteboard or the post the answers to the whiteboard and it looks like from those that voted more than half do not only a little bit more than 10 percent do okay next question is do you use devices in your classroom with students And at first, I'll clear the ones that are there. So, if I cleared your vote for the second question, please vote again. Do you use devices in your classroom with students? And that's right, Peggy, your students could be adults. Okay, again, I'm going to post these. And for this question, almost half do use devices with students. About 10% don't. Our third polling question is this. Have you used iPads to enhance learning through creative projects? Again, let me clear the other answers first. Have you used iPads to enhance learning through creative projects?
Again, I'm going to post these to the whiteboard. And for this one, a little bit more than a third, very close to a third have, and not quite a third have not used iPads to enhance creative, to enhance learning through creative projects. Okay. I'd like to introduce Linda now. Uh, she started teaching Common Core long before it had that name. Her students use apps such as Explain Everything to demonstrate their learning. Recently, her students made video subtraction stories. They used found objects around the classroom to present a subtraction problem and its solution. Her second graders are currently blogging on kidblog.com, where they have been writing app reviews. Her ideas are simple yet innovative. Linda is a tech coordinator at Melinda Elementary School. She's been instrumental in bringing the Bring Your Own Device program to the school. After winning a grant, she has implemented an iPad program into her second grade classroom. Among other things, her students have created iBooks and videos that showcase learning. She's also a district teacher of the year in 2012, a smart exemplary educator, and a Discovery Den member. So, Linda, I'd like to ask you to tackle the newbie question on the next page. What does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use web tools in the classroom? Hi, everybody. Um, well, I think that Web 2.0 means a lot more collaboration and you know exposure to the real world. And I use the I use tools in my digital tools in my classroom because I want my students to be be able to move on and be contributors to the world and to learn really learn what tools they're going to need in some form as they get older. That's all. <laughs> I I decided to do this presentation on how I integrate iPads in a primary classroom. So it, it is really focused on the process that I've gone through. And I think the first thing I want to do is give you a, a little bit of background on where I started because you know obviously I've been teaching for you know a long time and I, when I started, we had one Apple IIe in our in our whole school. So, you know, I started with that. I was the tech coordinator, so I had an Apple IIe, but I had to take the floppy disk up to the office if I wanted to print. You know, then we we ended up getting an a Apple 5500 in each classroom, which was amazing. But it, you know, then it's the um, the one computer classroom. You no know, internet, just you know whatever programs you buy plus you know what's you know there was nothing free at that point. When I moved to Melinda Heights Elementary School, we were the new school in the district, and we were like we had the gold card, so we had you know computers in the classroom. I had four computers for twenty students, and you know it was like being in tech heaven at that point. So I, I was able to actually start using technology with my kids, and then iMovie, you know, the i the i books came out, and we had an iBook cart, and I was able to actually start using some technology the way I envisioned it. You know, when you look back at it now, it's it doesn't seem like very much, but we made fairy tale commercials. My first graders at that point made fairy tale commercials that we submitted to the California Media Festival, and we actually won, which was amazing. Um, Hyper Studio was a favorite. You know, I did a family history project. Kid Picks was my go-to app at that point because it was easy to have all the kids contribute a slide and then put together a movie slideshow. 
you know, but they were limitations even back then. All the programs were expensive. You had to get a copy for each computer, you know, 50, 50 60 bucks for kid ticks or whatever you needed to do. And everything was complicated. You know, when you look at back at it now, it was complicated. You had to have cameras and cables and VHS tapes. And, you know, you had to transfer to the VCR. And, it, you know, I really wanted to do it. So I went through all that thinking, you know, hey, this is state of the art. But, you know, looking back now, it's not, it wasn't so great. And I always wanted to do more than what I could do. I, I always wanted that next step that I couldn't, couldn't do. And then the tech became old. So, you know, we, then we ended up with old computers. California had the budget crunch. We had no more money. And our computers became old. We had internet, but that was pretty much about it. We had no money for new software, not money for new computers. It was really a struggle to do classroom projects. Our school um, ended up spending some budget money on some smart boards and I had notebook software. So I was training teachers one afternoon with my friend Joanne and I, I was thinking that, you know, some of them have a really hard time even learning, you know, things that they have in their classroom or access to every day. And I was thinking, my kids can do this. So I went back and the next day I had them start creating a project a review project where they each they worked with a partner and they created projects on notebook software and they reviewed you know they their assignment might be to teach a contraction lesson or nouns or verbs and then the kids created it on the notebook software and then taught the lesson to the class so that was fun and that just used the technology that I had available which is really what you have to do so that's where it all began. I know that might have been pretty boring, but that's how I started. And then the iPad, which is so life-changing for technology in the classroom. You know, and I, of course, you know, I've struggled with trying to integrate technology, and then the iPad comes out, and I'm all over this. I wrote a grant with my teaching partner and we got got the grant, the CTEP grant, and we had 12 iPads to share between our two classes. Well, you know, of course, being who I am, that's not quite enough. So our school and our district were promoting bring your own device. And you know, you really think, okay, bring your own device, that's not for little kids. Well, it is for my class. So bring your own device in second grade? Well, why not? I asked my kids, you know, how many of you have iPods or iPads at home? And at least half of them raised their hand and said, we have an iPad, we have an iPod. So that kind of made up my mind. If they already have it, they're already using it, why not bring it to school? We do have district support and, you know, administrators support at our school. And we started with four, four classes at our school. We had two second grade classes because, of course, you know, I sucked my partner teacher into bringing your own device. And Joanne, our fifth grade tech coordinator and my friend, also sucked her little, her partner friend in as well. So we had four classes. So now what do you do? It's okay, we've got some devices. You know, I probably had eight or ten kids bring in a device. I had six to use all the time. And my goal was to use the iPads for more than drill and practice. There's a place for that, but I wanted to really use them to their full potential. And I wanted to use them to encourage higher level thinking skills. I wanted the kids to collaborate. I wanted to engage them. And I really wanted this tool to change my classroom. You know, it's, al it's always how I envision being able to teach. It's taken me forever. You know, and it's kind of sad that now that I'm, you know, close to being done, I finally am able to do this the way I want to do it. So is this scary? Yes. You know, you're bringing your own device. The parents don't understand what you want to do. You know, do you, are you just going to play games in the classroom? 
So you have to explain it to the parents. You have to be able to let go of some things, and it's really hard. My classes have always had good test scores, which you know everything's based on test scores. And I kind of was a little worried for what's going to happen when I started letting go of practice books, worksheet lessons. You know, it's, it's scary. So I, what I did was I took a deep breath, I jumped in, and I started by explaining to the kids right up front that we're learning together and, you know, we were going to just try this and do the best we can. So I just thought I would go through and show you some of the apps that, that I use often. And I didn't target um, drill apps. I, what I did was try to include in the presentation um, what kind of apps lead to more creative or higher level thinking skills. So, you know, not the math or the you know, the multiplication drill and that kind of stuff. So what I did was go through and list my favorite ones. One of the things that's awesome to use, and it's a great launching point for other apps like Subtext and, and apps that you can get within Ed, Edmodo, is Edmodo. It works great on the iPads. They have an app. And you can, the, the great thing about this is you can put the kids into groups when you want to instruct groups of children, differentiate instruction. It's great for discussions. Um, subtext works in here, like I said. It's awesome for connecting with other teachers. And, what, and one of the things they've done is they, they have a basal alignment project in here where you can, um, you can go in and, and look at the the textbooks, the reading books that that we have been using. You know, obviously ours are are really old, and we have um, Houghton Mifflin. But they what they've done is they've taken the third grade and up basils, and they've kind of given you some guidelines and questions on how to teach that story using more Common Core like reason. Well, not Common Core like, but resources, questions, how to teach it based on common core standards, I guess is what I want to say. So if you haven't looked at that, um, take a look at the Basal Alignment Project because if you have an old series, it, it really does add life to your stories for now. Okay. <clears throat> One of the, the fun things we did at the beginning of this year was use Pick collage, you know how we always, teachers, primary teachers especially, always do get to know you um, projects. And I, of course, want to start right away with the iPads. My kids started bringing their iPads the third day of school. So we, we have this free app called Pick Collage. And we use this the first week of school. And I taught the kids how to use the app first. It's got a very, you know, easy, format, and I showed them, and they got it right away, and I let them go for it. They found pictures of their favorite things, they added text, and they saved them, and then they emailed them to me. I have the iPad set up with a, a generic, you know, a class email that they email from and to, so it's kind of interesting, but it works. So there's, there's lots of skills embedded in this project. You know, they're getting, they're finding pictures, you, you can search the web from within. In, in the app, you can annotate it, and their projects turned out pretty cool. It was interesting to see how some of them figured out that they could take pictures of things around the room or that they, you know, they have their privacy folders that had pictures of them on it, and they took pictures of that, and then the kids who had their own iPads had an even bigger benefit because they had pictures already on their iPads, so that, and that was pretty fun. And then, of course, they were begging to use it again because they love it. Can we use Pic Collage? Can we use Pic Collage? So the next week, um, the second graders were working on um, the nutrition lesson, on healthy foods and junk food, and you can see the picture right there. So what they went into Pic Collage and made, made a Pic Collage of 
um, healthy foods and junk food. Then within Pic Collage, you can you can search for pictures right there. So you can either take pictures with the iPad camera and get them from there, or you can search the web from right within Pic Collage. And the third graders were reading a story called Lost and Found, and they saw the second graders working on the healthy food, junk food. They wanted to do another one. And so they they made projects about what what might you find in the Melinda Heights Lost and Found. And they they just took pictures or found pictures of things around the classroom. A few of them put some really interesting things like diamond rings and iPads and hopefully those things won't be found in our Lost and Found, but there you go. So that was a really fun, easy, and this is a pretty quick, um, pretty quick project because the kids get this app really easily. The next thing that's um, really necessary in my classroom is Google Drive, and I, you know, sometimes I, when I first hear something, I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do that? But this has been amazing since they updated it to be able to use the app and it now works, which it did it for a while. Um, so Google Drive is awesome, you know, for, for partners that want to work together. Last year I had my second graders work on a collaborative project with a partner and I showed them how to share a document so they could both work on it. And they, they just loved it. I had a couple of girls who loved it so much that they worked on it from home because they thought it was so cool that they could do it that way. And I have both of those young ladies again this year in third grade and they already started sharing documents and working on documents with each other. Doctopus, if you use Google Apps for Education and you haven't taken a look at this, this is something you really need to look at. It, it allows the teacher to hand out documents to students. So then you can share the documents with individual students with groups or with the whole class, you have choices, and you remain the owner of the document, so students don't have to remember to share it back with you, and it makes it really easy. It creates your grade sheet and you can just flip through and grade the assignments right there and put your grades in right there. And if you have Google Apps for Education, take a look at this because it's awesome. It's a little tricky to figure out, but once you've done it a few times, it goes pretty well. And I've, I, I've struggled with, you know, things like trying to have the kids share things that we can put up on the smart board, like if they're all taking notes or they have a comment or we're brainstorming something. And what I did the other day was share a, share a document with the whole class so everybody in the class could could add their comments. So everybody was writing their notes and comments and it was pretty cool because we could project it but they all could see it on their iPads and add additional comments. It was, it was pretty cool to watch. And one of the things that I'm still learning but I love already is subtext. And I, I've kind of been playing with this and Joanne's in the chat too. She's been w in this with me and we've been going, you know, at, at ISTE and, and at Q, we've gone to presentations and, list, you know, talk to the people and really trying to figure out how to use this because it's not, it's not so easy on the teacher side until it finally clicks. And Joanne and I went to EdCamp San Diego a few weeks ago and that's when it, you know, Holly Clark was, was doing a little presentation and that's when it finally clicked for me, okay, I can do this because she did a great job um, walking through how to do your side, the teacher side of it. It's, it's not a big learning curve for the kids and they, my second and third graders are using this right now. We're doing Charlotte's Web so I found a digital copy of Charlotte's Web they're actually reading it on the iPad in subtext and you know they're able to highlight and ta tag sentences and um, really 
go back and look at it after they tag it. So um, I was thinking about this the other day and thinking about how to bring nonfiction reading into this, you know, vocabulary and highlighting. So I think making a PDF of a science or a social studies chapter and hang, handing out digitally and then having the kids highlight and tag and annotate and you, the teacher gets to see everything the kids are doing when they tag and answer the questions. You can do all of this within the app and you know you can go back in the text and ask questions and have them highlight, you know, totally common core. So um, that's subtext. I recommend that if you have access to devices that you really take a look at this and, and you know don't don't give up because it's because it's a little harder. Just, you know, really keep going and and do it because it, it's going to be one of my favorite apps. I'm learning something about it every day and I love it. And the kids are having a great time because when they can come back and look at what they've done, they just really like it. So that's subtext. This is one of my absolute go-to apps. I love Explain Everything. And you really can't explain everything. You can make teacher tutorials. You can, I taught my kids at the very beginning of last year, so they were just out of first grade, and how to use explain everything. And I have samples, and when you go to my web link, I can't show them to you right now, but this, this explain everything project was um, fractions. And you know how fractions of a group are really hard for second graders. And you know, they made the background. This ended up be, being an all-day project, which, when, you know, when you're doing projects, you kind of have to allow for that. But they had the best time on these. And then we just used stuff we found around the room. You know, the, that volleyball in that picture is a ball of clay. And they used the teddy bears. They drew backgrounds. So they, they incorporated their own art. And this one was, was really cool, because they figured out how to make the volleyball net. The, you know, the volleyball is hanging on a string. And it's pretty cool. So it was fractions of a group. This is a great app for assessment. And I've used, I've used it by taking pictures of money and making a template and then having them sh count the money and write it and record it and talk to it as they're doing it. And then they submit it to me and I can see if they've done it correctly or where they've made a mistake. It's awesome. And you know, I figured out the hard way. I kept I kept trying to figure out how to get good pictures of coins that they could manipulate on the screen. And you know, and this is one of those duh moments. Like I just finally took pictures of coins and then put them in there, which was really easy instead of trying to find good pictures. And the cool thing about Explain Everything is they've they've had some updates that now allow you to to put to save this to directly to Google Drive or Dropbox or email. So you can save it as a movie, you can save it as a project, and the movie files are really easy to share. But as far as if, you know, using this for an assessment, the kids talk and do whatever I ask them to do, moving tens and ones, counting money, showing me how to do subtraction with regrouping, you know, and I really, I make them talk and explain it to me at the same time. So that is my one of my very favorites. Kidblog is a great resource for publishing kids' writing, and we, you know, I'm still at the point where they're doing their their drafts on paper at the beginning of the year, but I let them keep a personal blog where they they can write whatever they want, but I also assign written assignments. And I'll ask them a question and then they'll have to answer it. When we were doing um, last year, you know, a lot of opinion writing, I asked them a lot of questions that related to opinions. Why, you know, why, why do you um, think that kids should have iPads or do you think kids should have iPads? Why, you know, why this, why that? And then you just ask them questions and they have to go through the whole process of writing an opinion, you know, as you were writing on paper. Well, they did write on paper first, but then they published it. And the students learn how to comment on each other's writing. 
and the, the cool thing about Kid Blog is the teacher gets to approve all the posts before they are made public. And so if you have any inappropriate comments, you can just delete them or call the kid over that made the comments and you know, teach them at that point how to respond correctly. You know, cool is not a great response for somebody. You know, what did you like about their writing? This is a learning process for lots of parents. And um, you know, even though they can read and comment, I had some kid, you know, some parents who really didn't get in the habit of, of reading and responding. So, you know, it's it's always, you know, a challenge with the new technology resources we have to get the parents involved at the points where they can get involved. And um, so we really enjoy Kid Blog and the kids in we haven't gotten fully into it yet. You know, we just started school not too long ago. And you know, that is a go to app for us though. And Kid Blog is isn't just an app, it is a website that you can use. Okay, another go to app, this is a must have in my in my classroom. Book Creator, I I've tried all different kinds of, well, I pretty much tried every one that was out there. And this is the one I ended up choosing because it's easy for the kids and it makes really great looking books. And you can add sound. You can see on that cheetah's um, cover, that's a cover of one of the books the kids wrote. They can add sound to every page and they can add video and they can add, you know, things that, pictures and crop them and my kids are prolific book writers. They write books about just about everything and they can do this on their own if they have something, you know, that they want to go and write a book about. I haven't taught my class this year. I have 10 kids from last year who are already asking, are we going to write a book? Are we going to write a book about this? It's really easy to share the books. Their updates have um, allowed you to email the books as PDFs or EPUBs. You can put them in iBooks uh, if you have iPads, and then we have a library of them in our on our iPads. So they love this. They love putting the about the author at the end, and you know it's amazing what the what these little kids can do. They love this one. Okay, the next favorite thing, I guess I have a lot of favorite things. QR codes are, you know, <laughs> I have to say, I saw these a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago. I'm like, what are you, what in the world are people going to do with those things? Well, I figured it out. It's, um, we have a QR scanning app on all the iPads. I use Scan because it's so easy. And I don't think I put the link for that on there. And so, you know, what kinds of things do I use QR codes for? I use them for web links. I will, I will make a QR code. I use QR stuff just because it's easy and I don't have to think about it. I use, I make bookmarks. If we're going to a website, I can put it on the smart board and they can just take a picture of it with scan, it takes them directly to the website. It's so much easier than trying to have kids type in, well, adults too for that matter have them type in a whole web address. So I use it for web links. I've used it for scavenger hunts around the school. I've used it for math reviews. If you can see that little sample of the picture. Um, I made this page last year when we were doing fact families and the picture of my girls down at the bottom, they were working on this. When they scanned the code that was on that paper, they, came, they got three numbers and they had to make the fact families that went with those numbers. It is, um, it's math and it's just the same as a worksheet, but it is way more fun when you just get your numbers and you have to figure it out. I've also used it for my kids that finish math fast and they're done with their workbook page. I've taken pictures of the answer page and then made a QR code when they can just go and check 
you know, with an iPad, they just go check their math and then they're finished. They show me what they what they had and they're done. They can move on and then I can continue working with kids who are having a little bit more trouble. Um, I used this for open house last year. We we did a unit on famous Americans, and they <laughs> they wrote interviews with their with their famous American. They pretended like they were reporters, and they wrote an interview with their famous American. Then they found a friend to help them record it, and they were each one person. They recorded their interview, and then we made QR codes and added them to their reports that were on the wall. And the parents were able to come in and scan and listen to their, their students' record, reports and their interviews. And some of the interviews were hilarious. Somebody asked Robert E. Lee how, how, how did he handle having so many kids? And um, he said, well, after the first one, it was easy. So that was pretty funny. You can also link movies and um, sound, like I said. And you know, one of the ideas I'm toying with this year is having them use Explain Everything to make a video or you know, explain everything, and then make a QR code to put in their interactive notebook. So I'm, I'm playing with that, and I haven't really found the way for them to easily make their own QR code. So they still have to email me the file, and I have to make it, or they can make it on the computer. But there's no, what I really want is an app that will let them do audio and make their QR code right there. So. If anybody wants to make me one, I really need that. Brain Pop, I think most people know about Brain Pop. When you have when you have the iPads, it's pretty awesome because the kids can go through an assignment on Brain Pop, say on rounding numbers or you know parts of the body or whatever, and they can stop the video and take notes at this at this time you know, when they need it. They don't have to wait for the whole class to take a note. They can do it on their own on their own time. So we use it for that. There's good little quizzes and, you know, a great resource. And um, these are just some of the other apps that I use. Um, Spelling City, I, you know, I buy the premium version. Lots, lots of teachers at our school do and it's an amazing resource. It kind of takes spelling off your plate because the activities are good. And um, VoiceThread is awesome for making quick videos or sound bites. And you really need a subscription to that one to make it work well. But and our district uses Haiku LMS. And you know when I I don't know about five years ago when we were thinking about an LMS my first response was like, what would I do with that in second grade? And well, I, my life depends on it now. We ha I put all my homework online. The parents just access it from home. I post links, resources. The kids um, participate in discussions. And online discussions in second and third grade, yep, they can totally do it. One of my favorite ones was should um, when LA was going through that that deal on should they ban chocolate milk, was my kids had to write opinions on whether they should ban chocolate milk or should kids have whatever kind of milk they want. Okay, so those are my basic apps. We use other ones too, and um, I noticed that somebody said that Scan is now a dollar ninety nine. It was free when I got it. There are other other scanning apps that are just as good. I have I've tried several of them. And any scanning app is um, is good as long as it scans a QR code. So how do you get started? First of all, you start with short little lessons. You teach the kids how to handle the iPads, how to share the iPads. You know, one person drives at a time. You don't grab the other, grab the iPad. I teach them how to close tabs, how to quit the apps. You know, we want, the kids are responsible for wiping the screens, shutting them down before I put them away. 
One of the first things I teach them is taking pictures. How to take a picture, how to crop a picture, how to save a picture, because once they know this, they're really um, able to do lots of other projects. So easy and awesome, a great project. You know, and the first, you know, the first one is that get to know you. So the first lesson is how to take a picture. Another thing that I recommend when when you are getting started on projects is teach kids how to plan their projects. Teach them how to storyboard. Teach them how to take notes. And it's really important for them to go through the process, the writing process, and and really learn how to make a project. I, I don't ever let them get into making and explain everything or writing a book unless they've had a unless they have a plan. They don't have to draw the pictures or 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 you know put pictures in on their plan, but they have to know what they're going to have a picture of, and they have to have their text written. It makes it makes the whole process go so much more smoothly. One of the things I really like, and you can see when you, if you go to my website and look at their um, at their projects, is I really like to include student artwork, not just pictures from the internet, because this is where you know they're combining their creativity and just adding their own touch. So I, when they write a book or make and explain everything, they have to include, you know, depending on how long it is, I ask them to include at least half of the pictures hand drawn and colored. And these are some of our famous American projects. They did uh, wiki projects last year on famous Americans. So these were some of the pictures they added to their haiku wiki project. Obviously, an important part of using any kind of technology, or just being a teacher, I guess, for that matter, is to be really clear about your behavior expectations from them. And you know, you you almost have to be ruthless about it to start with, because you know, one, if somebody really messes up, and you know they're doing the wrong thing. It's so important to follow through. Like if you if you tell them that you know they're not going to be grabbing an iPad or running with an iPad, and then they do it, you're sending the message that it's okay and your rules don't mean anything if you don't follow through. And you know I think something that's really important is let the kids know you're learning with them. I mean as teachers we always want to. Um, know everything before we think we can teach it. And I think just letting them know that we trust them to learn some things and you know they can figure it out and I have no problem saying, okay, we're going to learn something new today. What can, you know, I'm going to learn with you. We're going to try to figure this out. And they, they really respond to that. You know, I don't even pretend that I know everything and I forget faster than they do. So I'm always asking, well, how do we do that? And then they always remember. Um, be aware that it's messy. I almost didn't put this picture in because, you know, when I take pictures of my kids working on a project, I my room is just a mess because they're sprawled all over the floor. They they're at their desk. They have books and papers and iPads and, you know, it's almost embarrassing when somebody walks in there because it's just it looks like a disaster area. It's controlled chaos, but it's it's learning happening. Okay. You know, and one of the things is not to assume that the kids know how to do something. You know, you you're, you're probably you know you might think, oh well, I showed them this a couple weeks ago. I always review. Okay, how do we do this? So I teach it, I reteach it, I review it. That that just resolves a lot of um, issues with. Oh yeah, I forgot. It might be me that forgets, but I you know I want them to know. Make a plan and kind of know how what you expect and what what your end result is going to be, but be flexible because you know there's a good chance it won't go the way you intended. When you know there's always an internet problem or something happens or the iPad battery dies or whatever. So just 
you know, be flexible. And if it's, you know, if it's not going well, don't be afraid to just put it away and take it out another day, because it's not, it's not going to be the end all, be all. So just, you know, if it's not going well, stop it, and then come back to it, re, re, rehash it in your mind, and then try it again. Um, allow enough time. My projects usually take longer than I think they will. You know, I budget a certain amount of time, and I sometimes, you know, when we did that fraction action video, you know, I allowed a couple hours, and it took all day, but they were having so much fun. They, a couple of them told me, it's the, this is the best day I've ever had. So they loved finding stuff and building stuff, and it just took quite a long time. Awesome project, though. And, you know, it wouldn't be really fair to go through and say, you know, this is all fabulous and, you know, it's the best thing ever, which it is. But there are challenges and there are limitations to the iPads. You know, I'm sure that this will get worked out, you know, because I always want to do more than I can do with my technology. But think about this before you start. If you're going to go through all the the trouble to make all these projects, how are you going to share the projects? So are you going to have the, are you going to set up an email account on the iPad? Are you going to use iTunes, you know, Google Drive, upload it to Haiku or any other LMS, put it to Dropbox? There's lots of options. You just have to have that piece figured out before you do it. And printing is obviously an issue unless you have a printer that will go straight, you know, that the iPad will print to, which is not the case at our school. We have some horrible printers and, you know, so they they print they print at home or, you know, I bring them home and print them their books and things. So, you know, just think about those kinds of things. You know, internet access obviously if you don't have it at your school that would be be an issue. And I see a comment about BrainPop being super expensive. Our, um, our student council funds BrainPop. It's, and when you look at, at having it for the whole school, I wouldn't buy it for really a single classroom. But if you can get your student council or something to buy it, it works. And, you know, I also see a comment about using Reflector or Apple TV. Both of those work for us. So if you wait until you think you know it all, you will never start. So, you know, if you have an, one iPad or a few iPads, you know, just jump in and try something. Don't be scared. Just do it. And you're going to, the results are worth it. And you know, there's, there, I had on that first slide, you know, how can I get an iPad? Donors choose? Any other kind of grant? There's, there's money out there if you want to um, do the work to get it. And if you want to look at some of our projects, I put a page, page there with some sample. This isn't all of our projects, but I have a haiku site. Um, that has some of our past projects on it. I don't, I don't really have any from this year yet that I've put up there. And there's my email address. I, I let my other website go, so now I have to start over. I let my domain go. So there's my new one. It's not up yet. And if you want to see me on Twitter, it's at Rudels. And that's that's the end of that. <laughs> okay, Peggy. Lori will be turning on her mic in just a moment to ask some questions that have come up in the chat. Okay. Thanks, Peggy. Most of the questions that I asked or that I caught were already answered. Uh, one that, that I think Peggy had was do you teach the students how to storyboard in advance of using it or as part of the creating for the projects? 
So did I they storyboard with, first and, and then make the projects? Yes. I, I teach them. Uh, we've already done several storyboards this year because that's the very first thing I teach them before we touch you know, the project on the iPad is to, you know, I, and you can do it different ways. You can make a format with writing and, I, you know, I do have a template, but, and, you know, with a picture on top and text on the bottom. It just depends on the project. A lot of times I just give them a blank piece of paper and they make their plan, their pictures or write their text. They, I usually have them do a sketch if they're going to use a picture that they've drawn. They take a picture of it with the iPad. So I've, I've done it both ways. It's, it's easiest just to give them a piece of paper, but when they're very first learning, the template is awesome because it shows them where to put their picture. They know to stay within those boundaries when they, so that when they take a photo of their picture, it's all contained. And then their writing can go down at the bottom. They can put page numbers and organize. So I, I do both. I use plain paper and I use templates, depending on depending on whether I've planned it far enough in the head that I have the templates run off, <laughs> I guess is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you assess, assess student projects done on iPads? Do you use a rubric to assess their, their work? I do, and I put, I always put the, what I'm going to grade them on up on the board. So before they even start their project, they know, okay, I'm going to be gr I'm going to be grading you on, you know, the correctness of your sentences or I'm going to be grading, you know, the the, the content. How many facts have you included? So they always know what I'm going to be grading on. And if I have just one target that I'm, I'm looking for, then I won't put up a full rubric, but they know ahead of time what I'm looking for. So mm -hmm. yes, I do use rubrics, but I also just, you know, if it's a, if it's a single, um, single item that I'm looking for, they just know what I'm going for. How do you get paid apps like Explain Everything on student bring your own device iPads? That's a really good question. And what I do on my on my website, I post at the beginning of the year um, to have the parents buy it. I don't I don't really ask for that many paid apps. Mm -hmm. You know, I do ask for Book Creator and Explain Everything, and the parents are willing to purchase it. I mean, they, you know, obviously they've put money into these iPads and they want their kids to be able to do what the kids in class are doing. Sure. I purchase, we have a very small budget. When I wrote my grant, I got some money for, you know, I budgeted some money for apps. And I, I, I'm very frugal with buying apps, so I don't buy very many. There's a few go-to apps, and I always buy them personally before I would ever ask a parent to purchase an app. Mm -hmm. I buy it and I try it out, and or, or before I purchase one with school money, for that matter, I try it out and make sure it's worth it. Because you know, there's some that I've purchased that are not what I thought they would be, and you really don't know until you have it in your hand. What app do you recommend for people to start with? Um, it depends on whether you have money or not money. Mm -hmm. Pic Collage is great. There's some free writing apps um, out there. There's, a, there's actually a free version of Book Creator. You just can't do quite as much with it, but there is a free version that came out not too long, long ago. So they do have a free version. Those are my two go-to apps. But there, you know, there's there's, there are things like Doodle Buddy or EduCreations. Those are free. EduCreations is similar mm -hmm. to Explain Everything, and so that's a very good one. Do you and start with, the, with an comment. idea? I'm sorry. I was, yeah, I, was I, have, I have lots of, of ideas. ideas. In, in, yeah. yeah, do you start with an idea and then have the kids actually work on a project? Or do you start with an idea and then find an app that will help them do that project? Um, I, I start with an idea 
But I really, mm -hmm. the, the apps that I have, <clears throat> my go-to apps, you know, um, Pick Collage, Explain Everything, and Book Creator. If I could only have three apps, those are the three I would choose because you can pretty much mm -hmm. do everything. And, you know, Explain Everything or Educreations if you don't have money. You know, those are the three that I would would go with. And yes, ideas come first, but and then I figure out how I want to do it. But somebody actually asked, "How do you come up with the ideas to use?" With I don't know. They percolate in my head all the time, you know. And then I'll see something, you know. And okay. sometimes I'm in the shower, or sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, and you know, I'm driving to work, mm -hmm. or you know, sometimes really I'm in the middle of a lesson in class, and I, I just, I'm like, well. You know what? I think this would be perfect. So I don't know. They just they just happen. Mm -hmm. I think those are all the the questions that I managed to capture either during the show or um, as I was I began to ask them. So thank, thank you, Linda, you for having me. The this slide relates to the Connected Educator Cafe that's still going on for Connected Educators Month. And Tuesday, October 29th, Brandon Busteed is going to be there on a Student Bill of Rights. And I think Peggy was going to speak a little bit more about the Connected Educator Month. Yes, I'll just say a couple of words about that. If you haven't been participating in any of the Connected Educators activities this month, they have been incredible, and there are way too many to go to. But the fabulous thing is that they are recording many of them. And Connected Cafe is one that's really unique because it's um, hosted by Steve Hargadon, and he invites special guests to join him. And then he just lets them talk about things that they're passionate about, asks them hard questions and drills down on it and invites all of us in the room, in the Blackboard Collaborate Room, to participate with them. So we can ask questions or we can get on the mic and chat with them. It's just a great way to connect with other people. So October is a long month, so there's still almost another week to go. Um, so if you haven't gotten into any of those, try to join a live session. And certainly if you can't make the live session, Go in and check out some of those recordings. This is um, the site, connecteducators.org, where you can access everything from there. So I hope that you'll check that out. Thanks, Peggy. Oops. Here we go. Uh, this slide reminds you that you can nominate a featured teacher, like Joanne did to nominate Linda. So there's the form, it's at tinyurl.com slash CR20Live featured teacher nominate, but you don't have the E at the end. When you exit the room, the link for the survey for today's show should open. And here's the direct link for the CR20Live survey. Um, it also will be in the chat box. Uh, you can open it if you are watching the recording right directly from the chat box. Or you can also open the link from within the live binder. So there are many ways to get to the survey for today's show. And on that survey, you can also request a professional development certificate. Please try and use a personal email address when you make this request. Uh, some schools will block the um, survey email. So by participating, you, you can get a certificate. The Classroom 2.0 Live shows are available in a video collection in iTunes U as well as an audio collection. So you can play it in both formats. This 
is the icon for the RSS feed. That's another way to get the updated information from the show archives from the Classroom 2.0 Live site. So there are many ways to, to get to the recordings. So I want to extend, we want to extend special thanks to Linda Rood for being our featured teacher today, to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and Web 2.0 Labs Project, Weebly for providing the website for Classroom 2.0 Live, and to everyone who participated in the show. Uh, we also like to thank Blackboard Collaborate for providing this, this platform. Thank you all for coming. If there are, oh, these are the upcoming shows for Classroom 2.0 Live. Uh, November 2nd is Sam Patterson with Puppets in Education. November 9th, Shelley Terrell YouTube video editing tools. Um, I'm going to be the feature teacher on November 16th. Uh, November 23rd is a joint presentation with EdCamp New Jersey with a face-to-face -face meetings meets virtual. So somebody at Ed, EdCamp New Jersey will be presenting, I think. And November 30th, there's no show because that's the Thanksgiving weekend here in the United States. Uh, there's still the announcement there about Connected Educators Month that's got another, another week left. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming today. And I will now close the show, unless there are more questions for Linda. Thank you, ladies.